Black Swan Thoughts. Natalie Portman's crotch saw a lot of action in this film. I mean, it had to be said. There's a lot of her sexuality in this film. It really worked rather well as the kind of symbol for her trying to release her inhibitions, you know. As I mentioned in the review itself also, you know, sex, you have to let go somewhat. You can't be in perfect control and complete control all the time. And, you know, Natalie Portman, when she's... It's pretty directly hinted that she is indeed a virgin in this film. I guess she doesn't love sex too much anymore. And you believe it, you know, her performance as this incredibly pure character is just so spot on. And then as she, you know, once she starts down that road, you know, after that first attempt at masturbating, excuse me, it just... You know, it, it takes over more and more. She... Yeah, I like how she literally is giving in to her sexuality, her sexual urge in the club, and then suddenly her pure, you know, the regular Nina comes back out, you know, and she runs away from that guy. That's gotta suck to be that guy, really. I mean... A woman always has the right to say no whenever, and the guy should always respect that, but that's gotta suck to be that guy. And, you know, she has, uh, you know, this wet dream about Lily, you know, that, I guess the last thing of that night that was actually real was the fact that Lily stuck her head out and said, you know, where are you going, you know, away from the, when Lily is on her way, Nina is on her way away from the club. That must be the last thing that's real. And I think if you think back to it, I don't think the mother, Erica, I think her name was, actually reacted to Lily, really when they came back, you know, I, I'm not entirely sure, but I don't think so. And when she does give in, you know, and Lily is, you know, taking the oral exam, it, it then becomes that her dark side is going to destroy her, you know, Nina. And that is, you know, the fear. That is when you're a perfectionist, when you're a controlled freak, when you believe that if you release your inhibitions, they will destroy you. you know, that's what you believe when you think that you have to keep them under control, you know. That was beautifully done. And maybe I should just talk about the ending at this point because that works as a segue. I think she stabbed herself partially to get the good out of her, you know, and because she had repressed the darker side, the... unequivocally destructive force too much, you know, like, if you, on occasion, air out the destructive side, the aggressive side, then that sort of thing doesn't happen. But she didn't. She kept it in. That's, it started manifesting as her scratching herself, you know. That wasn't something supernatural happening to her or something, which I'm sure people who are smart enough to 
you know, understand this movie, already know that, but it was her scratching herself, you know, the appearance of that was, of course, her dark side, but it was because she couldn't keep a lid on it all the time, you know, it's like a boiling pot, you know, sooner or later you have to let some of the steam out of it or, you know, the lid's gonna come flying off. Maybe not flying, but you know what I mean. That was what happened. The lid flew off, you know. The destructive energy was so destructive and directed towards herself that that's what happened, you know. I interpret the ending as her having stabbed herself and her bleeding probably to death there at the end. And I think she did kill Beth. The obvious argument is, you know, you saw her with the the um, nail file in the hand and, you know, blood on her hand. And I also just think, you know, it's that kind of love-hate relationship with the perfectionism, you know. She wants to be perfect more than anything, but at the same time, she really wishes she could let go and just stop trying to be so perfect. So Beth, the her idol in a way, the other girl who was trying for perfection, who let jealousy drive her to such a destructive act, you know, self-destructive, she became you know, the target for her frustration with the drive to, you know, her striving for perfection. One thing about the whole thing about that she thought that she had killed Lily I think they should have spent just a little bit more time with her being anxious before she started dragging the body away. I do like that she drug the body away, but she very quickly goes from what have I done? I actually killed someone to dragging the body away. I mean, suddenly we're in, you know, Hitman Codename 47 territory. Like, she just grabs the legs and starts dragging the dead body away as if she's done this for years, as if she's, you know, a hidden woman or, or something. That just, that was a little too soon. But I do love the reveal of, you know, no wait, there's no blood under the, the towel, you know, which, you know, the blood coming out is also, you know, the, the dark side. She can't keep it hidden. She t puts it behind a door. No, it seeps out, you know, and opens the door and there's no body again. Or, yeah. And that it was really her two sides struggling with herself. That was really good. The guy on the subway train, this maybe isn't going to surprise you at all, but I would definitely say he is complete just a manifestation of her, you know, she's projecting her sexuality. She's, it's, it's trying to get out. She can't handle that it belongs to herself, so she, you know, same thing with people who, you know, bash on certain sexual minorities, just saying. And I think Veronica was Nina's other crush, like before Lily came there, she, that was why she was staring. And there's, of course, also the whole thing that she is socially awkward, at least a little bit. It's not seen so much, but it is hinted at. You know, there's, I mean, her mother really freaks out when she's trying to go out, you know, and, you know, you, I guess you can't really count her laughing at the compliment because she was high at the time. Always a good excuse. Um, but 
she's a little socially awkward, so it's all also that, you know, I don't think she's one of the girls entirely. I mean, notice her role in the conversation about Beth early on, before we even see Beth. She's the defender, you know, the others are just saying, ah, oh, she's so old, you know, we have to get rid of her, or Tomas should just get rid of her, but, you know, she's like, oh, she's a good dancer, you know. And, you know, we all know the type. Some of us are the type. And that type often doesn't have a lot of friends, so... Anyway... I... don't know if I think that Veronica was entirely used as much as she maybe should have been. She kind of disappeared from the movie, you know? I mean, did we even see her at all after she said, what is this, a sick joke? You know, paraphrasing slightly, but you know what line I'm talking about, you know. I think she just disappeared from the movie, and I think it would maybe have been good if she had appeared at least a little more, I don't know. There aren't a lot of things to complain about in this movie, so... Excuse me. I liked Cassell's use of the sexuality. I would personally say that if you look at him objectively enough, I don't see him as like just, you know, someone who uses his dancers. Or at least not for sex, you know. He pushes them to in order to get the best performance out of them, and yes, like Lily points out, he's not the nicest guy, you know. But the whole sexual thing, you know, him seducting Nina and him talking to her about sex, I don't see that as him coming on to her. I see that as him trying to awaken that in her. Well, you know, when he's talking to her about it, it's because he maybe has an idea that that's what she needs to, you know, she needs to channel her sexuality more into her, her sexual urges more into the, the dance, you know. And him seducting her is him making a point, you know. He's saying, this is what you need to do to me and to the audience. Near the end, the camera work. I mean, it's practically dancing along with them. That was just fantastic. I will grant that I don't watch a lot of, you know, dance sequences because musicals aren't my thing, but it was fantastic. It really put you in the moment and just held you there. You know, that's one of Aronofsky's gifts as a director. He puts you in a moment and he just holds you there. And sometimes he's a bit cruel with that. The skin from the finger... Yeah, sorry for reminding you of that. Not my favorite moment of the film. But I'm not unhappy that it was there. And it's also just a perfect, you know... Peeling off the outer layer, you know, looking a little underneath the, you know, because that's what she's afraid of. She's afraid of what's underneath this thin veneer of purity and perfection, because no one is entirely pure. She has the sexual urges. She has the urges in general within her, of course. She just can't let go. She just can't quite give in. I. I have to commend Portman for, well, her entire performance, of course, but the way she just, with the sexuality, she just throws herself into it. I mean, you buy her purity, but you also just, there is nothing fake about her, her sexuality as she 
expresses it in the film. It's it's so real and I'm not going to make some negative comment about how she kind of used to be a prude, but that was just, you know, in this fantastic as the... And I would also say that a credit to her performance and to the writing and to the direction is the fact that at least three times in this movie I almost cried and that almost never happens. I hardly ever cry period and I hardly ever cry at movies. In this three times, you know, almost, in, you know, what, 110 minutes of film. Some of sadness, well mostly of sadness, and once of joy. And the one of joy that was, it was 20 minutes in. How do you do that? How do you connect with the character that much in 20 minutes that her success is your success? You know, you, you, you feel it. You, you're practically jumping out of the chair. You know, just... That is incredibly impressive. I'm, of course, talking about when it turns out she has been chosen for the Swan Queen. The ending is both beautiful and bittersweet. I, I love that, yes, she probably dies, or at the very least, I don't know, she probably won't dance for quite a bit of time, maybe not ever. But she's happy. It was perfect. I felt it. You know, it... And everyone, you know, the, the, the reaction, the turn, from all smiles and the whole, you know, everyone is happy for her success, for their success, for the success of the play. And then suddenly it dawns on them and on us that it was indeed real because we've seen so many hallucinations up to this point. We're not sure. What is real? What, what happened? Did anything quite happen to her that was quite real, that wasn't something manifesting? I think it was real. That is my take on it. But she's happy because she did it, you know. It destroyed her, but she let go. And the transformation, the literal transformation of her into the black swan. It's the kind of thing that could so easily look silly, or... If not silly, then dramatic in a different way. It's the kind of thing that you would maybe see in a fantasy movie, you know, or a superhero film. That kind of thing, you know, that thorough of a physical transformation. When the feathers come, and as she winds up having complete wings. But it just works, you know. And the hints of a transformation, you know, the little hairs that grow out of the, you know, on, on her back where she's scratched. And when her, excuse me, feet start to, you know, I guess turn, turn into, like, you know, in, in her bedroom, start to turn into the 
kind of, I guess, legs of a swan, or at least a, a bird of some sort. And it's also the kind of thing where some other directors would have gone further. They would have said, no, it's not enough that she just, you know, she passes out after the legs. I think it was a, a great idea that, you know, that happens, and then she bangs her head, you know, and that, it knocks her out. It's just plain and simple. And then the mother's in the room. Of course, it wasn't that big of a an obstacle, you know. If she pushes it enough, you know, she could, if she really barges in, she could probably still get the door open in spite of that stick being there. And I also think that that's, you know, you, maybe that's really when you realize she does care about her little girl, you know, she really does. Erica does not want something bad to happen to Nina. You know, I mean, when we see that she's asleep in Nina's bedroom during the masturbation, you know, it's surprising, but at the same time you kind of say, yeah, of course, why not, why wouldn't the mother do that? But then later, she kind of redeems herself, and she does show up for the play, and you can tell she's happy, you know, it, it, I'm really impressed with the way the character of Erica, she wasn't just like a superficial, you know, negative stereotype of a parent, because that's so common. And it would have been so easy to, to turn this character into that. It's difficult to turn it into something else. But they they did it, you know, writing, directing, and acting in all three regards, it just worked with her. And one thing that I do have to thank Aronofsky for not going there, I really thought when we saw the web toes, I really thought that that would bother her so much that she would grab the nail file and cut it open. And I'm really glad that that's not what we got. In general, just the hallucinations just really worked. They didn't go too far. And there wasn't really... There weren't any of them that were, you know, gratuitous or didn't hit the mark and serve their purpose. And I think that's it for my Black Swan thoughts. So, I hope you enjoyed it.